So this is the first of a message series in which uh, the pastors did not pick the topics. You did. So if you don't like what we're going to talk about, uh, you asked for it. <laughs> we asked for you to supply um, some questions of faith or, or things that you would like to explore more, to have more information about, to be able to understand a little bit better. And we got a lot of questions about eternal judgment. We got a lot of people saying, well, how do I know what my eternal destiny is? Or how do I know what the eternal destiny is of my loved one or friend who, you know, didn't believe in Jesus or who had this mental illness or who fill in the blank? You know, we got lots of different um, concerns there. Uh, what will God really judge us by? By our faith? Uh, by, by our works? Is there something we can just do? Uh, how can we get to heaven? How can a good God send people to hell? What happens to someone if they die and they've never even had a chance to hear the gospel? Uh, also, if God knows everything, if God already knows, you know, where I'm going to end up, then what's the point, right? Like, uh, what's my part in all of this? And even do heaven and hell even really exist? So I just want to open real quick in prayer, because I'm kind of like the kid who chose a way too big research topic. <laughs> And your teacher's saying, that's too broad, narrow, narrow. You got 25 minutes here. So uh, let's, let's, would you pray with me? God, we have so many things we don't understand. So much. And God, your word, you tell us that, that your Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. We need that now. We need that continually. God, would you open our ears to hear what we need to hear, the truth that is your truth, not something that I'm making up or something that, that I'm trying to say, but God, your truth that we need to hear this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So, amen. So because I can't, uh, so because I can't, you know, do this justice in 25 minutes. I don't even think, not only because I don't have the answers for you, I'm sorry to disappoint you there, uh, but also because I feel like if I tried to answer one of these questions in 25 minutes, man, I could just make a train wreck out of everything. There's so much information. There's so much to be explored. There's so many intricate layers, and, 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 and it's a delicate subject. And so as one of your pastors, here's my goals. That there's two things I want to do. One of the things I want to do is take this next 25 minutes and simply lay the groundwork and, and talk about what I believe from a scriptural and Christian perspective are the really important and necessary big rocks that have to be in place if we are going to try to have any kind of meaningful and responsible and productive and helpful conversations around the topic of eternal judgment. So just laying groundwork is all I intend to do here in the next 25 minutes. And then... I don't want to waste it after we've laid that groundwork. What I've decided is uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday this week, uh, I want to go ahead and explore um, a lot of different perspectives that are out there about some of these things um, because it's actually really interesting. And actually, Christianity is really diverse. The, the, the umbrella of Christianity um, has a lot of different perspectives within it. And so uh, if you want to just take a picture of this, I'm going to do Lunch and Learns um, starting at noon. They're going to be video conferences. If you might be interested in joining us, uh, you can be at work or wherever. I'll, I'll text you links so that you can click on and join us. Um, they're going to be in a Zoom conference. Uh, but those are the three topics that are there. And my goal is not to tell you the answer or what you need to believe about it but to share with you the multiple different perspectives that there are so that you can hopefully be a little bit more informed when you hear other people talking about it. You can say, oh, that's because they subscribe to this and also be able to try and sort things out and make sense of it for yourself. It's really interesting um, what's out there. So I encourage you to, I think you'll find it informative and helpful should you choose to join us for those. But as for today, let's go ahead and get started. So uh, anyway, how many of you have been taught that eternal judgment or heaven and hell is an after you die type situation? 
I believe that probably most of us, because that seems to have been the afterlife, the after you die emphasis, seems to have been the emphasis for several years now in uh, Christian theology and in, in tradition. But it wasn't always so heavy on the after you die. In the beginning, it was actually very, very different. And I think that this emphasis on heaven and hell and after you die um, and, and, and us like really, really focusing so heavily on that has been a huge problem for us. It has been very, very problematic. At its best, it sometimes tends to distract us from the lives we need to be living in the here and now. And at its worst, it can be a tool by people in power in religion to be able to try to control and manipulate crowds. We don't need to be focusing on that so heavily as we do. And I'll tell you why. I don't think it's faithful to a reading of the entirety of scripture. When we read the words of Jesus, when we read the words of Paul, when we read the words of John and many other of the writers, sometimes because we've been so heavily focused on the after you die piece, we read that back in. But if you just plainly read it, there is so much more that it's a balance, that, it, that judgment is both a present and a future reality. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we do it every single week. The one Jesus taught us, what do we say? We say, your kingdom come, God, here, now, on this earth, your will be done. We want God's kingdom and God's will and God's, God's presence and God's reign to come near and, and reign here and now with us. Because the term that Jesus uses, the kingdom of heaven, is simply wherever and whenever God reigns completely. And to a certain extent, we can have and experience the kingdom of heaven here and now. As a matter of fact, a, a seminary professor, J. Richard Middleton, um, I'm going to read you a quote and I'm going to tell you ahead of time, you're not going to like it. But it's interesting, uh, here's what he says. He says, there is not one single reference in the entire biblical canon, Old or New Testament, to heaven as a disembodied eternal destiny of a believer. And he says, I always challenge every year my seminary students to find it. Where is it in scripture? Because he says, while this idea has a vastly important role in popular Christian imagination and even in some theologies, not once does scripture itself actually say that the righteous will live forever in like a soul's paradise somewhere in heaven. He goes on to argue for a holistic view of ultimate redemption, that God will restore all of the things in the physical matter and the reality that's here and a new heaven and a new earth. And Jesus actually preached about the kingdom of heaven coming near, being with among the people. Uh, when we look at heaven on earth, Jesus talks about, um, and these are, there's three times in the book of Matthew. First is John the Baptist's message. Then it, when Jesus goes out to begin preaching, it's his one-liner that the contents, the summary of what he preaches is, hey, repent, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven has come near. And then when Jesus gathers his disciples and says, okay, I'm getting ready to send you all out to do your own preaching, and they all get sent out, he says, listen, here is the contents of your message, what it needs to be. Here's what you've got to tell the people. I want them to know the kingdom of heaven has come near. It's tangible, it's touchable, it's here and now. And in the book of John, he has this lovely phrase that he uses uh, over and over, three times actually. He says, a time is coming in the future and has already come and there's different things, basically where we can enjoy the reign of God. 
I, I want you to know that I believe, friends, every single time that you obey God, that you make Jesus the Lord of your life, your place, your situation, your, your motives, your actions, every single time that you pray and, and every single time you search the scriptures and every single time you gather together for worship or for Christian fellowship, every single time that you encourage somebody or, or forgive somebody or every single time you care for a child that needs cared for or a sick person, every single time that, that you use your gifts to bless the world and make the world a better place, whether you're fixing something with your hands or building something with your hands or solving some kind of problem or speaking or, or, or teaching in Jesus' name, every single time you do that, you participate in the kingdom of heaven and you are part of bringing the kingdom of heaven to this earth, a place where God reigns. Your obedience matters. And, and its reverberations are felt throughout the cosmos. The warmth and the light and the blessing that you pour out by being obedient to God, by allowing God to reign, is felt by the world around you. Dallas Willard says, the gospel is less about how to get into heaven after you die and more about how to live in the kingdom of heaven before you die. Sometimes we focus so heavily on the afterlife to the very detriment and exclusion of the here and now, when I think it's a very much overlapping reality. The kingdom of heaven has already begun, and it is also coming. Even John Wesley, who was the founder of the movement of Methodism. In his sermon, The Scripture Way of Salvation, he says, and first let us inquire, what is salvation? He says, it's not what's frequently understood by that word, the going to heaven, eternal happiness. It's not the soul's going to paradise. It's not a blessing which lies on the other side of death or in another world as we usually speak. He says, you are saved. It is not something at a distance. It's a present thing, a blessing which through the free mercy of God, you are now in possession of. So if the kingdom of heaven is, is both a present and a future reality. What about hell? When we read in, in the book of Romans chapter one, Paul begins to tell us a little bit about um, what this is happening here. And, and notice that he's using the present tense. It says the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth, who reject the reign of God. And Paul goes on to say, here's what happens when you live in such a way that you reject the reign of God, you create a hell for yourself. And he begins to describe it. He says, they become filled with every kind of wickedness and evil and greed and depravity. Uh, they are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. And we get this picture created of this world, this hateful, violent world that ensues when we reject the reign of God. Can I tell you, it blows my mind whenever I hear people a lot of times intellectuals, right, who talk about and want to argue about and discuss about and philosophize about whether there's a hell, right? Like, so I just graduated from seminary a year and a half ago, and that seems like a popular thing to talk about, you know? Like, no one wants to believe in a hell. We want to, not, we want to believe it away, right? And so we sit and philosophize about it. Well, is there really a hell? And I think you can sit and philosophize all day, all, all day long, all you want about this, or you can just open your blinds and look out the window. Because this ugliness, this violence, this hatred, this murder, this strife, this envy, all of this stuff is happening already here and now. Friends, judgment is both a present and a future reality. We can see with our eyes what hell begins to look like. It 
And in this chapter where we see all this hateful world that people create, when they, when they reject God's reign, when they disobey God, when they put their own greed or their own lusts or their own desire and craving for power ahead of God instead of letting God be God, when we see all the stuff that people are doing and what the consequences of it, if you read all of Romans 1, you see God is doing the same thing and it says twice that God's doing it. You know what God's actions are in that chaotic situation? It says God is giving them over to what they want. Twice. God is giving them over to their sinful desires. This does not paint a picture of God sadistically trying to invent methods of torture and cruel ways to punish people. As a matter of fact, it turns out people are actually really effective at doing that themselves to one another. God is sadly giving them over to what they want. And as readers, we shake our heads and we think about how bad all the really bad people out there are. The word is used, they, they do this, they do that. Until we get to chapter two where Paul takes a very surprising turn. I'm gonna read chapter two, verses one through eight. There's a lot in there. I'm just gonna read it. Uh, Paul turns around then and says, you therefore... You have no excuse when you pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself because you do the very same things. He says, now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere human being, pass judgment on them and yet do the same things, Do you think you will escape God's judgment? Or do you show contempt for the riches of the kindness, forbearance, and patience of God, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant hearts, what you're doing is storing up wrath against yourself for the day of judgment when the righteous judgment will be revealed. God will repay each person according to what they have done. He's quoting a verse from the Psalms and an almost identical verse from Proverbs there. To those who by persistence in doing good seek glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth that they hear and who follow evil, there will be that thing he described, the wrath the violence, the hatred, the fury, the anger. That's a lot. Paul ends this chapter one talking about this awful, hateful, violent world that they create and then begins chapter two saying, hey, but what about you? You who think that you're really, really good. These would have been, he would have been writing to the, the, the Jews at the time who believed that they had the moral high ground. They had the, the Torah. They knew everything there was to know about God and they did their best to, to do everything right. To us in our day, it would be to the moralist. To those of us who consider ourselves moralist. Well, we do the right thing. Well, we've got the moral high ground. Uh, what he's saying here is the business of when you, when you stop and, and turn and put your focus on condemning others or saying where you think other people are going or where they should go or, or whatever, then what you're doing is just condemning yourself because the moralist themselves are under God's condemnation. Like we can have these really high standards of morality, but then we don't even actually live up to them all the time ourselves. So we're just end up condemning ourselves. And we get to this like sobering fact that even anyone, no matter who we are, none of us is entitled to cast the first stone at someone else, right? Self-righteousness, it's poop. It's just so worthless. It doesn't save. It never, ever has. It's completely worthless. And I get so aggravated. Please don't ever do this. It's a huge pet peeve of mine. But I get so aggravated when people come to me as a pastor, right, and they try and ruffle my feathers in wanting my professional opinion 
about whether a specific individual is in heaven or hell, or whether I believe they're going to heaven or hell, I want you to know, friends, I am not God. And, and, and you are not God. As a matter of fact, I am literally just a sinner saved by God's grace, and I too am hoping and am trusting and am longing to live in the presence of God and in the reign of God myself. So this brings us to the first big rock that I think is of ultimate importance if we're going to have any kind of productive or responsible discussions around eternal judgment, and it's very simple. It's three words. God is judge. Can you say that? God is judge. You know what? And I am not. It's, it's one of those things that's simple to understand, and we can say, yes, I agree with that, but in our actual speaking and in our actual acting, sometimes I think we forget the most important thing. Because God is the only one who judges according to truth. Friends, if I'm gonna have any shred of sanity around this, if I'm going to be a Christian, I have to believe that God is a just God and knows way more than I do. Why is that that only God can judge according to truth? I think it's because you and I, as human beings, we have views that are always going to be slanted by our own participation in the sinful structures and in our own wrongdoings of the world. And we're never going to be able to see completely clearly like God can. We're going to be tainted by our human loyalties, right? Have you ever heard anybody say, well, it's my country, right or wrong? I support it. Whether they're going to do the right thing or the wrong thing, it's my country. And then we might give concessions to people who are like us or look like us or think like us or act like us. But in the end, only God has all the facts of the situation. I love Kansas City. I love the Chiefs. <laughs> and sometimes when they do one of those like video replay things, I could have sworn his foot was not across that line. Or he, he was not off sides. What are they talking about? Right? Like, I am tainted by my own, and we have loyalties that we don't even know about. Loyalties to our country, loyalties to our race sometimes, loyalties to our profession, to, to our denomination, right? To our family, to ourselves. We want to defend ourselves, but in the end, it's all laid bare, and a righteous and good and just God can handle it. And this righteous God does take individual situations into account. Scripture seems to indicate that in several places. Jesus says in Luke 12, from everyone who has been given much, much more will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. If these people are in two different situations, God's gonna look at the truth and the light of that situation. God alone can set all of the facts in the light of perfect righteousness. And that verse I just read, it indicts people who know a lot. Did you know that? Did you hear that? Did you catch that? I think sometimes we, people who come to church, think that because we know more about God, that we're in better shape when it comes around to judgment. But this verse is saying, no, you're tragically mistaken. As a matter of fact, if you know more, the more that you know, the more ability you have the more you've been given, the higher you're going to be held accountable. Like if you think that you're better than someone else who doesn't know as much about God, you're not. Your lives are just going to really have to show it. Can someone say amen? amen. Our lives are going to have to show it. In verse 13 it says, for it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight. You just hear it over and over, that does not make you righteous, it says, but it's those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. And if this God that I claim to worship, that I claim to believe knows way more than I do, is a fair and a just God, then I need to put my whole self and 
my loved ones and even my enemies into the hands of a great and capable and just God. I believe it is an act of faith to let go of the constant need to be everybody's judge. It is an act of faith to say, God, you know better. With me, I trust you with my mom, my brother, my sister, my dad. I trust you with the people that harm me. You will do what's right, and you know more than I do. It's an act of faith. And we get a clue in verse four about the intentions of God. It says, in the character of God, or do you, know, or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing it is God's kindness that is intended to lead you to repentance. Friends, I think that sometimes we, we are mistaken because we think that because uh, punishment doesn't immediately follow wrongdoing, that lightning bolts don't strike people dead right away, that that somehow is proof of God's powerlessness. I'm telling you it's not. It is proof of God's patience. Uh, If you think that you are safe because God's judgment has not yet descended on you, I want you to know God is not simply just giving you a free pass to go and do wrong and to reject God's reign. What God is doing is giving you in every single moment and in every single breath, God is giving you another opportunity and another chance to hear and respond and to turn around and do things right. I think most of us feel a vague, undefined sense uh, that, they're gonna, that we're all gonna avoid punishment, that can't happen to me type of attitude, but I think it's important to not trade on the mercy of God. And when we find ourselves wanting to see other people get what's coming to them, and when we, we find ourselves wanting to see God punish someone else immediately, we forget how patient and kind God is. When we get frustrated that God is is not swiftly enacting what we believe the judgment that they need, God is giving them breaths and moments and opportunities to turn around and to respond. And we owe our very lives to the patience and kindness of God as well. Which leads us to the second big rock, I think, that It's really, really important if we're going to have discussions about eternal judgment together. It's the fact that God intends salvation for all. I'll read some scriptures, 2 Peter 3, 8 and 9. It says, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but wanting everyone to come to repentance. You see, friends, God, the heart, the the, the core, the essence of God is love and kindness. Loving kindness is a phrase that's used over and over uh, in the Hebrew scriptures. And, And what that means is God is going to do everything that God can and will and want to do to bring us to salvation, to repentance, to blessedness, to joy, to peace. And and, and so we see this picture of a God who wants us all to come to salvation. Jesus, who did all the work of of like crossing that incredible cosmic leap and and stepping into time uh, and and living and dying and suffering uh, for us is still at work for our salvation. It says in Romans chapter eight, verse 34, who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us, still at work on our behalf to bring us to salvation. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, God wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. All means all. We as people tend to segregate people into groups and categories. 
And we think some people don't deserve salvation or or we don't want them to get salvation sometimes. But that's not the heart of God. And if we forget that God wants and intends and wants all people to be saved, then we can get into really ugly conversations about eternal judgment. And finally, I think the third major truth here, one to me that from what I can tell and from what I can read seems very consistent with the whole of Old and New Testament scriptures. It's one you may not like very much. Is simply that humans are responsible beings. When we were created in the Genesis account, it says we were created in God's image. We were created as persons who can be distinct persons in relationships and and be able to make choices, even before Adam and Eve sinned and rebelled and the world went to hell in a handbasket, even before that, God gave human beings responsibilities. They were tilling the garden. They were caring for the animals. God created humans as responsible beings. And and it goes on in verse six when it, it contrasts that some of those beings will persist in doing good and seeking God and, 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 uh, wanting to live in the reign of God and others who will persist in self-seeking and rejecting the truth that they hear over and over and following evil. In Galatians chapter six, verses seven through nine, it says, don't be misled. Another translation, don't be deceived. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live to only satisfy their sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. We've already started doing it. Uh, But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. Already started that process as well. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. I mean, we have this common thing, I think, in our culture that says a lot, we want to blame shift. Uh, It's the way I was brought up. It's that person's fault. They did this to me, and that's why I'm this way. And we have all these other places we want to shift blame. And some of those things may have elements of truth in them, right? But at the end, too, we are responsible beings. And, And while God does take everybody's situation into account, and God knows the truth about everything, we can't pull one over on God, God cannot be mocked. God knows the truth. And we are responsible beings. And it's important, friends, for all of us with whatever knowledge and whatever uh, light that we have to be able to see that we walk in that, that whatever grace God gives us, that we respond to that and quit trying to blame anybody else because we're not going to be judged by the opinions we've held and we're not going to be judged uh, by the words that we use and we're not going to be judged by how highly others esteem us or our image. The last verse in that, in that passage says this will all take place when God, judge, when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. God knows it all. We're going to be judged by the kinds of lives that we live So that's the the groundwork that I think is important moving forward to be able to to have discussions that that are truth-seeking and that are helpful, that we got to remember judgment is both a present and a future reality, that God is the judge and we are not, And, and that this judge, this God, wants us all to be saved and not only to hear the truth and and hear the words, but also to respond to them because after all, we are created as responsible beings. Would you pray with me? God, I can't help but think um, how desperately we need you. (laughs) And God, with my whole self, I'm so grateful and I'm so thankful that even when you saw us in, in, in in a condemned position where we couldn't do anything to save ourselves, we couldn't even see straight or think straight because we were so confused. God, you came and made a way. You did the work, God, of showing us 
how to live and how to love, of, of, of dying God and, and redeeming what, what was lost and broken, our very own souls, God, that we can put our faith and trust in you, that you have, you're the only one that has the ability to pardon and to forgive and offer cleansing and grace. And God, we thank you for what Jesus has done for us. God, make us people who respond. I know you want us to choose, but God, fill our hearts with the desire to respond to you. And Lord, I pray that you would pour out your, your Holy Spirit on these, the, the gifts of bread and juice, that they might become for us the body and blood of Jesus Christ, nourishing both our bodies and our souls, that we can go forth and live in your reign. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.